chopped down into something that was not appealing to a lot of Mexicans and they didn't like it, but yet why was there no big rebellion? Well, there have been a couple of attempts. In 1968, students and workers, and, and they were reaching out in their you know, uh, spontaneous way to other sectors of society, but the students mounted a massive uh, rebellion. I'm sure everybody's remembering this now as you think back to 1968. It was on the eve of the Olympics in Mexico. The students thought that that gave them a window that the world, whole world was watching Mexico. It wasn't really the case. They, they were slaughtered in one of their meetings you know, by a, uh, an army assault. Many people were jailed. Um, you know, hundreds died in that assault, and it was a complete shutdown of political dissent in Mexico that lasted for a really long time. And only uh, in the last 20 years have, have the actual you know, uh, events of 1968 been kind of understood at the profound level, but it was what people thought all along. The government, you know, the president sent orders to, you know, shoot the students down and suppress the movement. But the getting back to the why people don't rise up in Mexico, that story cemented a view that like abuelas and grandmothers and grandfathers had been, you know, sending down, which is don't do it. It's not worth it. We went through all that and this is what we wound up with. So just keep it cool. Don't rebel. And that was that's that was something that was very strong, I discovered, throughout Mexican um, society. So when the NAFTA Accords were signed, and that came after a long back and forth, we experienced it here in the United States as a very close vote in Congress, a kind of splitting of the Democratic Party, one side of it being very much against NAFTA, the other side being for it. But when that hit in Mexico, and then the Zapatistas rose up, I was, I was uh, asleep in, in Boston that morning, it was New Year's, and somebody called me up and they're like, what's going on in Mexico? Uh, I just heard on the BBC that, you know, there's a rebellion in Chiapas, and I was like, oh, you know, holy shit, what, what is going on in Mexico? And I think that moment for a lot of people in the Bay Area, a lot of people in, in you know, the United States who had some sort of connection to Mexico was a, a, big, a big moment of both of kind of shock and, and like opening, like, whoa, that's, that's, that's the rebellion happening in Mexico that we didn't think would ever happen. Um, and it's happening because of an issue that's profoundly related to the connection between Mexico and the United States and the attempt of you know, the United States to once again put Mexico under its thumb. How did it even get to the point with NAFTA? It's because the Mexican economy uh, collapsed in the early 1980s. It collapsed as a result of Mexico taking on an enormous amount of debt to fund the uh, oil exploration and the oil industry development that it did. But the corrupt nature of the ruling establishment in Mexico at that point made it so that when that money uh, came into Mexico, the, the banks in the 70s were just wanting to throw money at Mexico. They had all these petrodollars that were, you know, that they were storing up and they were looking for places to put that money to work and they chose Mexico. Um, they didn't require a lot of, you know, uh, conditions on the money. So a lot of that money came into Mexico, was immediately channeled by the elites who, who stole it into U.S. banks. And so by the time the Mexican economy collapsed with a, with a $50 billion debt, which back in the 80s was gigantic, um, the, you know, the, the rich people had already gotten their money out of the country. Inflation took over. The country was in absolute economic chaos. And so these questions of like, how come people don't rise up and rebel in Mexico were, you know, becoming stronger and stronger as, as families who had been in the middle class found their, themselves sinking down. People who were poor, you know, were not, were, were, were not making it. And, uh, uh, you know, Mexico survived that period through two things. One, you know, they, they say that las madres mexicanas hacen milagros. They, they, people figured out ways to, to live with even less than they already had. And a lot of people came to the United States during those years. That's what those, during those years is when the, you know, the period, the current period of migration really got underway. NAFTA was sold to Mexicans. And I was down there at the time talking with a lot of people, like, you know, having talks like this about NAFTA. 
And, you know, to my kind of um, dismay at the time, because I knew it wasn't going to work out this way, there were a lot of young Mexicans who had bought hook, line, and sinker, the idea that NAFTA is going to bring up everybody's boats, we're going to come up to the level of, you know, wage equality with the United States. This is, you know, our government is doing the right thing to us. But the guy who was doing it was Salinas de Gortari. He was a fraudulently elected in 1988. I don't want to go into all those stories because he. I promised to talk about the present. But <laughs> in order to get there, there's a little bit of this. Salinas de Gortari, fraudulently elected, beat a guy named Cuauhtémoc Cardenas who had broken with the, the ruling party. They, at that point, what became the Mexican uh, quest for democracy, which was a, something that went across you know, uh, social lines to a large degree because on the right, on the left, people realize this institutional revolutionary party is something that's in our way if we ever wanna have a responsive democracy. So people were decided we've gotta do something about that. That's when the Reagan, Bush, administration was looking at Mexico and figuring out what do we do about this? Things are getting out of hand in Mexico. And so basically the way I've seen it over the years is that there was a, there was a race going on at that point. It was the race between democracy and, and people power and total integration of Mexico into the neoliberal economy. And the, the, the reason it's a race is because if you get totally integrated into the neoliberal economy, Democracy doesn't help you a whole lot because you can't do anything anymore. It, the, the, the institutional avenues, the uh, opportunities for state investment, all the kind of things that people in Mexico had traditionally wanted to do, they were going to be cut off. So that's, that race got going. Um, and the, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that... Um, made the situation in Mexico more turbulent, earthquakes that weren't attended to by the government, you know, where people saw, oh, this government really is corrupt. We believed in them. But, you know, when something like this happens, they don't take care of us. So a lot of discontent was building up. And so the U.S. The US started to encourage Mexico to respond to these democratic forces. And so for those of us like me at the time, uh, trying to figure out, like, what can, what can be done, it seemed like let's throw are weight behind the people who are running the race for democracy because there's a great case in Mexico for why the poor, if you have a democracy, would be in control because there's so many more poor people and uh, you know people who are not in the ruling class. And that had become clear to Mexico, uh, to people in Mexico, um, I think before it had become clear here, but it, it wasn't working out. So I, I, uh, I'm just gonna pause for a second have take a sip of coffee and uh, figure out what to say next. <laughs> hold the microphone closer. Yeah, hold it closer. Yeah, be happy to. Um, yeah, I was kind of holding it out here, wasn't I? So you're doing great. The, yeah, there's as I was saying to Roger before. There's just so much to talk about here, um, but the um, the place where you know I came into it and started working with Global Exchange was right after the uprising in Chiapas. The, there was a national election in Mexico and we started organizing with counterparts in Mexico observations of those elections. And we discovered all kinds of stuff, uh, one of which was Mexico is not the only country that has election problems and we've, you know, as a result, wound up inviting Mexicans and other people to come to the United States and look at our election problems. But what we saw in Mexico was that the system was fundamentally broken and that you know the folks who were going to change it uh, were you know they were trying to uh, do things like put in an independent electoral oversight board because the government ran the elections so how could you possibly ever change anything if the government's running the elections and the government wants to reelect itself so all these all these various things uh, happened over a period of many years and um, I'll just jump now to Lopez Obrador because he's one of the people who has come out of that, you know, that, that um, time of change. Back in 1994, when we were um, a 
sending people down to Chiapas to live in indigenous communities that were under army occupation. Lopez Obrador up in Tabasco State, which is just to the north on the Gulf Coast, was a, a community organizer and someone who had come to um, the recognition that he had to leave the Institutional Revolutionary Party. He had grown up in that party like virtually every Mexican who was politically active or had those kind of ambitions. He had come up through that system. But in 1988, with the election of the, the election in which Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas was defrauded, you know, defrauded of the election, Lo, uh, uh, López Obrador changed colors and moved over to the PRD party. Then he ran for um, governor of Tabasco State and was defrauded very blatantly um, by someone who had uh, from the Revolutionary Institutional Party who had connections with narco industry and and others. So it was a, he was up against a very tough. Uh, uh, oligarchy in that state and he led then a movement um, to denounce that fraud and that movement got, got pretty well beaten down but he he was working with other people to figure out well, what do we do next and one of the things they decided to do was to defend the oil workers the nationalization of oil in Mexico was one of the biggest acts of independence that Mexico has done from the United States in particular, but from you know international capital in general. They said, this oil's ours, anything under the subsoil of Mexico is belongs to the nation. You can't touch that. That's a sacred right. That's how it's going to be from henceforth. And because it was on the eve of the you know Nazi takeover in Europe and whatnot, the United States was like, <laughs> that's okay. We'll figure that out later. And Mexico was allowed to do that. So the national the nationalization of oil was something that people in Mexico really felt like defending. Lopez Obrador, in his home state, started bringing out people to you know defend the the oil industry. Tabasco is on the Gulf Coast where there's a ton of, of uh, oil. But the other thing that was going on out there was that the company itself, Pemex, the national oil company, was abusing people in those communities. Um, they were not paying when wells were exploding. People were getting hurt. Um, you know, people were getting gassed. There was all kinds of terrible stuff going on. So Lopez Obrador went out there uh, with his um, uh, other folks, you know, the, the people that he organized with down there, and they got, beat, they got the crap beaten out of them by the state police. So that's really when he came onto my radar screen. We organized a delegation, went down there, and um, met with people throughout those communities and met with him um, to, you know, and so... He's been marked in my mind for a long time as, oh, this guy seems like the real deal. Seems like he's really, you know, putting his money where his mouth is. He's very austere. He's a great guy. And so when he ran for president in 2006, we organized a pretty extensive observation effort only to see the election go fraudulent. And this put us in a very difficult position as international observers because generally international observers you know, are, are kind of there to say, well, you know, we, we saw this, we saw that, we saw the other things, make a list of criticisms and suggestions, and that's how most of them dealt with it. And we saw, oh, the, this, this election is being fraudulently taken from Lopez Obrador, we have to find the evidence. So we sought the evidence, we looked, and it was really hard to put your finger on it because there was a whole propaganda operation going on, but we did... Um, we were the only group down there that actually came out publicly and said there should be a recount, full recount. All the ballots uh, need to be, you know, 100% retabulated. It never happened. It was a fraudulent election. 2012, I don't know. But the thing that happened after Lopez Obrador was defrauded in that election was that he brought a movement out into the streets in Mexico City. Huge, huge occupation of uh, Reforma, which is the main corridor in Mexico City. He took a lot of heat for that because it was very inconvenient for a lot of, for millions of people. Um, but you had, you had this, uh, you know, huge pushback against the fraud. Um, and so when Felipe Calderon, who was the fraudulently elected president, came into office, his very first move, and this is critically important, was to go to an army barracks and declare an escalation of the drug war. And that's what we've been dealing with in Mexico ever since, is the escalating drug war. Because, you know, when we talked about Mexico and all its cultural richness and all this, the, the, that's not the image that's in most people's minds. Most people these days, if you ask about Mexico, it's immigration and drug war. Right? That's what Trump ran on, and that's 
a reality in Mexico that's it's a bitter and terrible reality. The Merida Initiative is is was the U.S. program to assist that drug war since the you know 2005. Uh, I think it actually came into to existence per se in 2009, but that Merida program has pushed three billion dollars into the hands of Mexico's military and has more importantly than that perhaps because the military budget in Mexico is actually way bigger than those three billion dollars but the, the the important thing is that the drug war model the same thing that we're struggling with here the drug war model that incarcerates people that you know uh, uh, tries to pretend that we can deal with the issue of drugs in our society through a prohibition that was being implemented in Mexico at tremendous cost to Mexican society. And the, the main strategy of the drug war was get the kingpins, meaning go after the big shots. If you could take out the big shots, then you know the problem, the problem will be dealt with. And of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't work. I mean, it's it sure it seems it seems just if you're gonna if you're gonna like fight drugs, why don't you take out the people who are making the most money from it? Seems like it seems sensible at a very superficial level, but the result is you take out the kingpins, the industry's still there, the all the reasons that people are taking drugs and buying drugs are all still there. You haven't dealt with anything in any way, and so the the industry metastasizes and it gets into more areas of criminality so now part of that is that the the uh you know the the drug gangs and the cartels and the people who are running these criminal industries they control extortion rackets <laughs> and perhaps most importantly for you know for the way we're thinking about it they control the immigration trade because the it used to be if you were going to go from Mexico to the United States, you could cross the border relatively easily, you could find somebody on the other side, you could get on a bus, you could go, you could go back after you'd been in, Me in, in the United States for a season doing picking or, you know, agricultural labor or whatever it was, you could go home with the money, you could, you know, you could just even, a lot of people did, you know, they'd do that for a few years, they'd, then they'd have enough money to buy like a truck and start a little business down where they were. So this was a, a economic system that actually worked pretty well. Um, but now, with the border more and more def defended by, on the U.S. side, with all the kind of, you know, the wall, the wall you saw there was like, that was the kind of original uh, incarnation of the wall. Th those were actually landing tracks from Iraq after the Iraq War. They brought that, uh, the, uh, they brought that stuff back from Kuwait and, you know, set it up. I mean, it's that, it's that direct, kind of that gruesome where all that stuff came from early in the Clinton administration. Um, but the wall now is much more sophisticated. There's a lot of electronic surveillance. So it's actually, you know, we've made the joke over the years, you know, uh, that, you know, you build the wall higher, we'll, we'll get a, a taller ladder. And, you know, that's a, that's, it's a joke. And it, it's, it, for a while it seemed like, yeah, you do, it doesn't matter how much you try to shut it off, people will still be able to get through. But it's actually become much more difficult. And, and secondarily, the drug industries, you know, the, the, the traffickers, on the Mexican side have blocked the way and said, if you want to go, it's with us. The coyotes, the people who used to take folks over in the, the old days for, you know, a, a nominal fee, um, you know, and it was a fairly easy thing to do, they're completely out of business. If they don't work for the cartels, they don't work, you know, or, or, they're, or they're, you know, they're dead, literally. Um, so that has made the transit from the Mexican side, whether you're Central American or Mexican, into the United States, vastly more difficult, vastly more expensive. So people are paying, you know, four, five, six thousand dollars, and it's hard to even imagine with the economies in those countries, you know, how people put those kind of resources together. But that's, you know, that's that's what's going on. So this last year, yeah, well, when we start, yeah, winding down, and yeah, this last year, Lopez Obrador finally gets elected. He's, you know, he's won once, twice. And then this time, as Roger said, he steams into office with with a, a, just an overwhelming vote. No uh, president uh, since Mexico's democracy has opened up uh, has gotten anywhere near the level of support that he got. The ruling, in, the the PRI, the old Revolutionary Institutional Party that was in power before he came in, they did not win. They did not get. A, they did not get a majority in a single precinct in the entire country. And they only won 13% of the vote. So this was a this was a major major shift. So the question is, 
how great or not great is the experience for Mexico to be with Lopez Obrador. And I'm going to wind down, but I want to give you at least a couple minutes on this because it's not all great. And a lot of people are very, very worried about the direction things are going under Lopez Obrador. In the first line of that, and you know, they're their opinion I don't think is definitive on this issue, but the Zapatistas, the ones who rose up in Chiapas in, in uh, the 90s and have held out there against everything the government's thrown at them ever since, they hate this new government. And they, you know, they never did like Lopez Obrador. Ever since 2006, they've been a, you know, a thorn in his side. You know, that people compared him to like Ralph Nader and, or, you know, that, that kind of thing, right? They've been, they, they have not liked the way that he's going. They see that he's made, too, for, from their perspective, he's made too many compromises. He's not enough on the side of you know, indigenous rights. Uh, they see him as a big phony. I don't really see it that way, but that viewpoint is very strong in many sectors. And there's people from the, um, from the non-governmental community, the, you know, the organizations that have critiqued Mexico's military, that have critiqued the drug war, that have you know, looked at the human rights situation, they're very worried because when Lopez Obrador is running for president, he said, we're going to you know, demilitarize the drug war, we're, gonna, we're going to turn it around, we're going to you know, have money for treatment, we're going to do those kind of things. And what they see is that he has implemented a National Guard which is a new military formation in Mexico, and they're very worried about the, you know, the, security, the national security measures that are being imposed. So there's a lot of concern. At the same time, and this is, this is on the hopeful side, just in the last week, Lopez Obrador said the Merida Initiative, this U.S. You know, program, said we're not going to do that. We think that that money should go to uh, assist communities where most of the immigrants are leaving. If you develop places, you know, a community economy, it's people don't have to leave. That's the case he's been making. That's something that I agree with at a very profound level. Um, will, will that actually be the outcome? That's what remains to be seen. You know, in terms of, the, in terms of his administration, it's, he's got a six-year window to work. If this were a baseball season, it would still be like halfway through April. For, so we don't know what you know what it's all going to look like it's it's very early he's been in office for six months and um we shall see and and i'm happy to go into any and all of that at any you know level of detail you want in the question and answer thank you very much